then there's going to be even more of that. But it's not all going to happen today. It's going to take time to build the trust that's necessary to get to the stuff that we never deal with, which is why we've been running back and forth and all around um, doing and saying and living in the same kinds of ways for 50 years, certainly, but much, much longer. Um, it's also going to take risk, and I talked about this a little bit before. Each one of us is going to have to risk differently. Um, sometimes when we're doing um, trainings on privilege, uh, and especially white privilege, what we'll do is when we get to that section where we're talking about white privilege, we'll have all the white people sit in the center of the room, people of color around the sides of the room, and the people of color watch the white people as we talk about white privilege. <laughs> it's a thinker. <laughs> I'll just let that settle in the room for a minute. So, uh, often, for white people, it's very uncomfortable for us to talk about white privilege, even with each other, let alone with an audience of people of color waiting to hear what we're going to say about it. It makes us feel very vulnerable. That's risk for us. It's not the only risk. It's just one. But it flips the script a little bit. When we think about what does it mean for us to come into these conversations, if someone has been on the receiving end of racism and then is asked to share what that means to them or what that felt like to them, that's an incredible amount of vulnerability. In a room where we haven't quite figured out what the trust level is yet. And I know it doesn't sound all rosy and, and happy right now, and I get it. Like, you know, the room is kind of doing this. Y'all are going to be doing stuff real soon. Um, but it's important. It's important. Risk is a huge part of this, and it looks and feels different based on our racial identity and the experiences that we've had as racialized people. And it'll feel different if we have never thought about what it means for us to be a racialized person before. Um, common values are a good way to strengthen a relationship. Sometimes we just we hold on to that one thing. Now, I did say we don't want to over-spiritualize things and say, like, if we just love Jesus more, everything's going to work out. But sometimes the thing is we do both love Jesus. So if this thing gets a little heated or gets a little tough or folks start crying, then we hold on to the fact that we both love Jesus and we press through. We press on because we believe that it's important enough to do it. Uh, but that's different than just kind of, you know, pushing it to the side and saying, well, this is all we need to do. Um, what I need lists are, if, so by a show of hands, has anybody ever been in a, a workshop kind of scenario or even just a teaching kind of scenario where somebody has said, okay, we're going to create a safe space and we're going to list the things that we need for this space to be safe. Has anybody been in anything like that before? Okay, so these are um, kind of lists that say, this is what I need in order to feel safe in this room. Um, those actually can be different based on our racialized experiences. So if we were just gonna do a workshop today about um, what does it mean to create safe space, for conversations where uh, we have people with different racial identities in the same room, this is what I would do. I would have one list that we would start with that would be our core list. And it would be a list where everybody would kind of join in and say, this is what we need in order for us to feel safe. Then there would be a second one, a second list, that would be only for people of color to create. And that would be the ally list. What do you need in this space to feel like the white people are your allies today. And that's a very specified list. Now, these are not the only two lists, but there are two lists. Because often what happens is the one safe space list goes to the dominant group. It's whatever makes the dominant group feel comfortable, and then everything is just kind of set aside as if this is going to work for everybody. So whoever happens to be minoritized in the group however that works out, ends up having to submit to the dominant list. So if you're in relationship with somebody, or building this relationship, and you've decided
started on a similar purpose and you've decided that this is what you're going to work on and you've got some common values together, it's time to get honest about what you need from each other in order for this thing to work. And that might be the work in and of itself, and that's okay too. Uh, and then I'll just say costly grace. Costly grace is the kind of grace that takes risk and says risk is part of this. This is not grace that just covers over things and says, well, you know, thank God we've got grace. Because this is going to take the grace that, that only God can provide um, and only God can and, um, come in and create something that we haven't been able to figure out how to do on our own. Whew. Okay, so my first career was in fitness. For 15 years, I uh, taught fitness classes and things like this, so uh, I'm just going to have a little throwback right now. If all of you could just take a nice deep breath and exhale as loud as you can. Okay, now with some, like, you know, some voice. Okay, so now it's just not just, right, letting it out, but like some, oh, like whatever needs to come out, okay? So nice, deep, 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 deep breath, like shoulders back, and go! <laughs> Writing down your response to how you feel hearing and reading this quote. 